There's Amy. She's she's muted. Amy's muted. Ah, uh, thank you, Barry. All right. We're at what six thirty two? Almost right on time. Jack, what do you think? Do we want to wait for a couple of minutes? Or do you think we go ahead and start? I would suggest getting going, Amy. We have uh, six or seven folks here in City Hall. Okay. And, uh, you know, six or seven on Zoom. So uh, I There's think we can nine on Zoom. Nine on Zoom right now. Excellent. I am so happy. Well, welcome to everybody at City Hall and welcome to everyone on Zoom. This is, this is a new thing for us in Castle Hills. Um, as you all know, we're working on our comprehensive planning, and this is sort of the second big phase of it, which is some speaker forums to educate everyone about some of the topics that we'll be including in, um, in the comprehensive plan once we start drafting it. So without much ado, I think I will turn it over. Jack, do you have a short introduction for our first speaker? Jack, you're well, muted. Okay. I can hear you, Jack. Can Better. you hear me now? Because if I unmute myself, it starts oh. to reverberate. Yeah, okay, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. But uh, folks, we're very delighted to have with us two gentlemen from LPA Architects here in San Antonio, Federico Cavazos and Leo Hernandez. Federico and Leo will be leading us through our comprehensive plan workshops. And they graciously accepted our invitation to visit with us this evening to help us understand what comprehensive planning is. Uh, what is it? Why do we do it? What good does it do? Why do cities need it? And uh, we think we have a great team in these guys and uh, we look forward to working with them. As Amy said, we're, uh, we're in the midst of our speakers forums. We have another session Thursday night and another session, well, all day Saturday. But uh, with that, if I may allow Federico and Leo to take it over. Thanks, Jack. Sure. Appreciate the introduction. And uh, we just wanted to start off by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to help you. Um, we um, are getting to know the city of Castle Hills more and more. Obviously, we live here um, um, in, nearby in San Antonio. Um, Leo grew up uh, in Castle Hills himself, actually. And but there's a lot to learn still. And it, it's, it's great to be able to um, kick off the speaker series as well with a topic that, um, you know, it can be uh, daunting, can be scary, but the goal is that uh, over the course of this discussion that everyone will feel more comfortable with what a comprehensive planning, uh, a comprehensive plan looks like and how uh, we need you uh, to be engaged to, to inform the plan. Um, and the uh, just a bit about us, uh, LPA is working uh, with Ardura, um, civil engineer here in San Antonio. Um, our, we have offices, six offices across the country, um, two in Texas. Um, you may have driven by our office on uh, South Alamo and South Flores. That was a picture in the, uh, of our office at the kickoff slide. Uh, we've been here for uh, 39 years now. So, um, really, you know, ingrained in San Antonio and everything in the San Antonio area. Um, uh, we've done work all across Texas, but um, our founding partner's goal was that we could all sleep in our bed at night every night. So the goal is to work local, to get to know our communities locally, and what a great opportunity um, this comprehensive planning effort is. Um, thank you so much again. So Jack, you um, uh, jumped straight to our agenda, which is what is uh, a comprehensive plan? Um, why do we plan? Um, how does the city benefit? Um, and we'll talk about the implementation and the design of a comprehensive plan. A plan is just a plan without uh, implementation. It becomes reality when, uh, when all of it is thought through. Um, so what is a comprehensive plan? A comprehensive plan is, is um, it's a guide. It's a North Star for a city. Um, and it, it, they occur um, at meaningful points in time in, in over the life of a city, usually every 20 years or so. 
and they help and steer uh, and guide really important decisions around zoning, around land use, around how the best use of taxpayer dollars can be used and help guide uh, the future of communities. Um, without a guide, without a plan, um, the, the uh, decisions are less informed and uh, an overarching vision um, can't be supported. So we really do applaud the city for recognizing the value of a comprehensive plan and for starting the process now. So what are the components of a comprehensive plan? The first is we will talk a lot about land use, about zoning, about green spaces, how about how you use this finite you know, set of acreage that the city owns? Um, because every block, every lot, every street, every sidewalk, every walking path is so important. They, they can all connect or disconnect uh, if not handled correctly. So land use and land use exhibits are a big part of the plan, not the only part, but a big part of it. Um, there's a lot that goes into a comprehensive plan that, um, that you can't see that's uh, below the ground. That's all about infrastructure and a lot at kind of the ground surface. So how we connect people and cars and bikes and utilities and green spaces and uh, recreational spaces is fundamental. What are the spines in a city that feed um, its residents that feed its businesses that feed its schools um, and 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 how can the infrastructure be uh, continue to be built to support great growth or meaningful growth for uh, the city of castle hills over the next 20 years um, the kind of the third big picture component to a comprehensive plan is uh, the economics around the plan um, around um, how tax money is reinvested. This is a very uh, specific expertise um, that uh, cities work through. Um, we uh, here at LPA and Ordura will be focusing on the land use and the infrastructure planning to inform uh, how it impacts policy. Because without a policy and without implementation, um, a plan can sit on a shelf. So the kinds of exhibits that we will be um, developing with you. Uh, and the we is everyone who can help us, everyone who can come to a meeting will be co-authoring the plan. Um, we are going to look at different street typologies. So what the how to out width is of streets, what's an appropriate width to uh, have the appropriate speed of cars, um, uh, how do sidewalks interact with streets? Um, how do they not, how does the bike path? Um, relate to streets, all of those different typologies will be looked at. We will look at, you know, there is a zoning map in place for the city of Castle Hills. Um, uh, you know, we will look at it, revisit it. Is it perfect? Are there opportunities for improvement? What does it mean to rezone a property? What are the different kinds of zoning opportunities out there? Transitional zoning, multifamily, single family, commercial. We'll, we'll talk about all those different kinds of zoning opportunities found in a, in a city um, like Castle Hills. We'll talk about the critical axes through your city and they're probably a, you know, appearing in your mind now. Uh, you know, North, Northwest Military Highway, you know, West Avenue, the Loop, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we'll talk about what are the critical axes now? What should they be? How can we improve them um, and which um, are ideal to focus on first, right? So kind of sequencing and phasing of the axes is important. We talked about active frontage, uh, all of those things that uh, line streets. What does it mean from the edge of the curb to a piece of property? What does all that look like? Is it landscape? Is it walkable? Is it for bikes? Um, so the kinds of frontage you would expect to see in your city, that will also be a big um, exhibit that will be developed. There are lots of right of ways in city. There are lots of easements. There are lots of um, drainage infrastructure, particular in the city of Castle Hills. And what are the opportunities there? Are there opportunities? There almost always are. 
So the first is develop, uh, we will develop an understanding of your rights of way, show them to you and hear from you, you know, which of these have more opportunity embedded within them. And then uh, last but not least, just formalizing, uh, you know, uh, biking and pedestrian routes through um, the city um, to connect meaningful places, maybe to connect to the larger bike network of San Antonio, if that is of interest to you. Um, and so just kind of a sampling of the kinds of exhibits um, that you will help us shape. Um, one uh, great urban planner out there, his name is uh, Peter Calthorpe. You can watch his uh, lectures on, he's given some TED Talks and on YouTube. But one thing that really resonates with us is it talks about um, the people, you know, the people understand what a great plan is and that their, their desire is there and their desire to get it right is there and the people who make up the community are those who know best about their community um, and so it all begins with listening to the people and communicating um, the ideas the wishes the hopes the frustrations also a very important part to understand your frustrations um, and how we communicate those out to the to the city helps build consensus around um, the right kind of plan um, for uh, the city of Castle Hills. So, um, but why? Um, why do uh, cities plan? You know, it all, it's all about, um, you know, your voice. And it's all about reflecting uh, what you say. Um, because what the end product is, is a document. It's a guiding document that the city will refer to long after the people who were involved with the process are. So um, the, the, the planners and the people who attend the meetings are not on, on call for 20 years. They produce a memorialized document. And that document wants to have your voice as kind of the steering factor. So there's kind of an image of what we're talking about. I mean, literally picking up the pen, the pencil, the marker, the sticky note, the, the dot, and we'll work together on, on maps um, that help explain um, what's happening in Castle Hills. Uh, Leo, you want to talk about these? Sure. So um, as Federico was saying, like uh, this is uh, uh, comprehensive plans rely heavily on the engagement and the participation of its residents. So uh, we uh, really welcome and, and invite everyone to um, as, as much as you can, you know, with the COVID situation and everything, but to come and, and, and express uh, not only your frustrations, or, as Federico was saying, because those are helpful, but um, we gotta be um, uh, basically bring or present an optimistic view of what the city of Castle Hills can be and can become mm -hmm. um, in the next uh, uh, several years. So, uh, you know, comprehensive planning, you know, there's, many, many uh, facets to a comprehensive plan, depending on the size of the city and the scope of the work that uh, needs to be done, you know, and uh, it, it can be not endless, but it can, it can comply uh, a, a wide set of, uh, of, of requirements and tasks. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the kind of the kinds of activities that we're proposing to engage with the city, are kind of outlined here, um, uh, primarily um, at, a, at forums um, at the top right. Uh, we'll have a workshop where we'll talk about uh, your opportunities. Um, we'll talk about what it means to spend a day in the life of uh, you know um, citizens of Castle Hills from all six neighborhoods. Try to spend a day in the life of someone uh, in the Southern Cone, you know. Um, and uh, communicate that back out to each other uh, to develop empathy around struggles that different citizens in the city have. Um, because it, it really begins with that understanding um, of, of, of how uh, every citizen has a unique experience within the city. And if we can hear what e how each other live in the city and how each other move through the city, where our pain points are, um, it'll help us come together around common solutions and build consensus together. Um, we'll talk about um, you know, uh, observations that you have in the city, kind of write out on a map, um, you know, 
what we see happening at this intersection, what's happening at this business, how could this uh, park uh, be better um, utilized or connected to a larger network. Um, so just some ideas about how, how the engagement uh, will occur. And uh, we uh, have included some examples of uh, comprehensive plans. Um, this, uh, uh, as mentioned before, this vary in, in, in size and scope, but um, these are very, um, I think some of the ones are very uh, successful in terms of uh, the, inclu uh, the inclusion of uh, the things that um, uh, the people and uh, the stakeholders uh, have um, uh, tried to incorporate into the plan. So uh, for example, the, one of the most comprehensive ones that, that, that we could find was the Denver's uh, plan for the future, which is a comprehensive plan um, as stated till uh, 2040, uh, 2040, which uh, I believe this was first put in place in uh, 2015, I believe. But um, as you can see, you know, if people come in and they uh, write uh, what, what the vision of the city will be for them in the next um, uh, decades, uh, you know, for their children, for their grandchildren. And uh, based on that, you know, and, and with other data available, they start bringing in uh, a vision and then the guiding principles that will um, basically guide the process through which the city can become this um, this better place for everyone. So in this case, it's equi um, equitable, affordable, and inclusive, strong, authentic uh, neighborhoods, uh, safe and accessible places, economically diverse and vibrant, environmentally resilient, and um, healthy and active uh, uh, spaces and, and culture as well. So um, these are some of the things that, uh, you know, and then they uh, begin to, uh, uh, just kind of reframe what this means for the city and their neighborhoods and kind of going from a macro scale, a large scale into the more specific, uh, going into the each of the neighborhoods and each of the zones uh, within the city. Uh, next slide, please. I, uh, I'm gonna back up for a second because that's one of the things I love about this image here. Mm -hmm. If you look at the kinds of spaces and surfaces, the scale jumps massively in a comprehensive plan. You can talk about street paving patterns. You can talk about, um, you can talk about the, the treescape. The trees, obviously, is one of the first things people think of when they think of Castle Hills. You can talk about the relationship of the sidewalk um, to the street, to the trees, about what kinds of parks are available. But then you can zoom all the way out from 30,000 square feet and take a look at the relationships of different commercial spaces two major corridors or major thoroughfares. So it's that kind of scale shift that is frankly fun about comprehensive plans that help give a uh, universal vision and universal plan so that the next time a street is repaved or the next time a sidewalk is rebuilt or the next time someone's thinking about planting some trees in the city, there's a guide and the guide is, is, is uh, unified. Um, so just, just an aside there. Yeah, that is correct. And um, another uh, example of a comprehensive plan is the uh, 2035 uh, Portland Comprehensive Plan. Uh, this, uh, most plans have, uh, in essence, some of the same uh, uh, key uh, guiding principles, but uh, I, some, depending on the, the uh, the, their demographics and the geography of the city, you know, they, they involve certain things or they focus more on other things like uh, uh, Federico was uh, saying on the previous slide, you know, it, it can be from the street section, how to improve the streetscape and, and, and make it more uh, transit friendly for, for, for the, uh, uh, the people that use it to uh, 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 zoning and land use, how to, how can we best use you know the land or or incorporate or adapt some of the the, the vacant lots or something like that? But uh, uh, Portland uh, in in this particular case, Portland is um, it's a very uh, it's very much going through a, a phase of uh, uh, economic and and and, and equity uh, issues where uh, there's not enough. Uh, 
uh, jobs or, or job security for some of the residents. So for them, the task is how can we implement, you know, bring manufacturing in? How can we be uh, more uh, uh, friendly to uh, local businesses and local entrepreneurs? Um, you know, and that comes with economic prosperity, uh, human health, and and also environmental health. You know, how can we put our 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 our, our our resources and our effort into making the city more uh, green, uh, um, uh, friendly, and 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 more uh, equitable for for everyone, not just from an economic perspective, but also from a health uh, perspective as well. Um, next slide. And then finally, um, this is kind of again going back to what um, uh, Federico was saying on the previous one: the comprehensive plan for uh, Charleston County and South Carolina. Uh, focus focus mainly on the the uh, connection between several of its neighborhoods with uh, its downtown and other midtown areas. So they look at land use and how they can maximize the uh, the, the the land use and zoning to provide you know mixed use development, multifamily. How do you connect those all these uh, different neighborhoods uh, with uh, bike paths and um, uh, trails and other things that can uh, make this city feel more um, uh, as a whole in as opposed to segregated into uh, different segments so their exercise was more about the strict sections you know how do, how can we provide safe um, um, streetscapes and 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 sidewalks and bike friendly paths for 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 the people that use them and I think this is a great example of not trying to uh, spread the butter too thin about having a real focus for the next two decades for the city instead of um, um, tackling um, radical change, you know, that, that would not be appropriate radical changes to the whole city, but focusing energy on specific corridors to connect and then getting that right and thinking about the inches, like just this diagram right here has a lot of information layered into it that talks about how to make it safe to bike. Uh, adjacent to a street, by uh, putting it above the curb, by having a planting line between it and the street, by having parking on either side of the street, and then which also helps slow down traffic. This is just what worked for them. This will work for Charleston. It may be a completely different solution for the city of Castle Hills, but again, it's that uh, it's it's that ability to think about many many blocks at once, about at the scale of a city while also thinking about what it means to walk in your city or to drive in your city, or to bike in your city. So in kind of in two images, tells the whole story um, of the comprehensive plan there. So how will we do this? Um, well, we always start by planning the plan, in this case, planning the plan for the plan. And uh, we got together um, with the comprehensive planning committee and uh, talked about um, this engagement and um, how that would work. So today um, it, we're at the end of August and um, you know, we're talking to you a little bit about comprehensive planning and what it is and why it matters. Um, and we will begin our um, community outreach um, in uh, the, the, the middle two weeks of October. Um, our plan is over the next uh, four to five weeks, um, we are working with your shape files, uh, which basically means um, your property lines um, and your, your zoning to develop exhibits around what's happening now. That way we can have a, um, a thorough understanding of the current situation and use those to inform our discuss discussions together. In our community engagement sessions, we would like for them to be as hands-on as possible if we can get this virus to cooperate. Um, uh, we'd love to have them at City Hall. We have had plenty of great sessions on Zoom as well. We have a series of uh, virtual tools that we can use but we are going to offer two of those uh, in the evenings uh, after work when, um, you know, we, we know many of you have, uh, like we do, families, and it's tough to get away for an evening and find a sitter or the kids. Uh, you may have, you know, jobs in the evening, so we'll offer two separate after work um, um, evenings in, in the middle two weeks of October for, for you to come and to give us your input. Um, after that, we will collect the, finding, the findings um, and present those findings back to the Comprehensive Planning Committee. 
um, to refine um, what we hear. Um, over the course of three meetings with the Comprehensive Planning Committee, we will, um, we will refine based on what we heard um, from the community engagement sessions, um, the plan. The goal here is to be as transparent as possible, to bring everyone along together, to solve the problem together and not to have a solution brought to you. Um, so transparency is kind of fundamental. Um, we welcome any and all input at any time through this process, but the, the, the end goal is to be complete by the end of the year in December to give a final presentation to um, city council um, to communicate where we're at fully along the way with the plan so we can get feedback as early and as often as possible. But we do want to set a deadline. We want to set time to finish the plan that way we can get to implementing it. So um, uh, the exhibit development will conclude at the end of December and the, the planning committee will work in tandem with us to put together um, the ultimate comprehensive uh, plan, the final comprehensive plan. But our attitude towards this is all built around, if you couldn't gather it, it's about our intense community engagement. It's about co-authoring. It's about working together. It's about being optimistic um, endlessly, um, especially when we hear about challenges or struggles, always believing that there's a solution um, and always believing that we can come together. Um, around the plan. And it's about bringing our local knowledge um, to the city. Um, so we have um, some knowledge now. Um, we uh, know that there's a lot for us to learn and we can't wait um, to hear from you a little bit about that. So um, this, uh, the following slide uh, basically shows uh, the existing uh, uh, city of Castle Hills map uh, and subdivided into uh, the different sectors, which is the west, uh, midtown, the edge, and then the terrace, the states, and the southern corn um, south of uh, Highway 410. Uh, and then two of the major corridors that um, bisect uh, the, the city. Um, we're, uh, we also have Blanco and uh, Jackson Keller, which uh, kind of go over the, um, the east and south, southwest. Uh, um, uh, property line of the of the city, but um, uh, we decided to focus mainly on West Avenue and Northwest Military because those are the ones that we think and have the best opportunity to um, uh, uh, for impact in the in, in the neighborhood. Um, so uh, you know, determining our future excellence. So um, these uh, six items were uh, brought for, for were pulled from the. Um, uh, the Create Castle Hills uh, document. So um, uh, the committee and, and ourselves on our, on our previous meeting, uh, we um, uh, sort of determined that these six items um, uh, are a good baseline uh, 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 points that we can start uh, kind of developing a little bit more. So, um, you know, neighborhood and heritage, uh, infrastructure, land use and zoning, transportation, uh, transportation in the sense of uh, 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 transit friendly, um, uh, accessible uh, streets and, and, and walkways, um, not so much transportation in the sense of uh, um, public transit, um, parks and uh, green spaces and, um, and community. And the kind of umbrella for these is, uh, as communicated to us, is um, making sure we address big concepts of this is where we live, this is where we work, and this is where we play. And we want all of those themes to run through um, all of our you know, decision making and, and uh, process together. So again, you know, neighborhood and heritage. You know, what are the the some of the guiding principles or or one of the key uh, factors that um, uh, can help us kind of um, inform and make decisions uh, and for our plan. So it's diverse, friendly, and open. You know, access to amenities, access to opportunities, and and, and creating that sense of community, which I think we think that uh, Castle Hills are. Uh, already has for the most part. Next one will be infrastructure. So, you know, safe, accessible streets uh, that encourage uh, active living, uh, community interaction, and it's also uh, uh, friendly to local businesses. Uh, the land use and zoning, as uh, uh, Federico was uh, saying earlier, um, if you look at the map, the, the current zoning map, uh, we see that uh, uh, 
all, all the white uh, is predominantly uh, single family uh, residences, but we do have some nods of uh, commercial, some multifamily uh, and some uh, uh, spaces that um, are either currently vacant or um, there's there's definitely opportunity uh, for us to um, to propose something that is uh, uh, hopefully meaningful uh, and and can help the the development of uh, the the city of Castle Hills for years to come. So when we're talking about land use and zoning, where uh, some of the guiding principles are, you know economically diverse and vibrant, you know, connected and accessible. So how can we connect some of these knots, uh, commercial knots with uh, with neighborhoods and other uh, places as well? Um, you know, they need to be equitable and inclusive. And again, you know, business uh, friendly to local businesses as well. And then transportation, you know, it, it's, it's about mobility choices. It's, it's about uh, providing uh, walkable and bikeable and accessible uh, streets and roads. Uh, you know, it's transit friendly and most uh, important than that, everything is uh, safe and inviting for the residents and the people that, that live in, in, in Castle Hills area. Uh, the parks and spaces is um, essentially, you know, support the healthy lifestyle. Uh, of, of, of its residents, you know, with vibrant green spaces that are safe and inviting. And uh, how we connect these spaces, you know, we, on the picture on the left, we, uh, we have um, a, a neighborhood park. Um, is there an opportunity to uh, connect some of those smaller neighborhood parks with um, the, the bigger kind of like more um, uh, um, established uh, trails in the, in the local parks. Um, should they be accessible amenities and services? Uh, we believe that there's an opportunity to create pathways and, and, and ways to uh, connect all of this so that people can um, not be secluded in the within their own kind of like a sector of the of the city of Castle Hills and they can actually connect to other places uh, via greenways. And finally, uh, community, you know, support and, and healthy lifestyle and, you know, being able to be diverse and friendly and um, have a community that is safe and inviting, uh, which, you know, I think some of these uh, guiding principles uh, are, are some of the things that are already existing in the city of Castle Hills, but, um, you know, how can we implement, how can we uh, um, allow for not just some sectors of the Castle Hills to, to to be like this, but try to bring as many people as, as we can uh, into this comprehensive plan uh, so that we can make it for all of Castle Hills. Okay, lots of examples, lots of principles. Um, we just wanna talk about how we have worked with other um, small communities uh, in and near San Antonio. There are not many um, comprehensive planning opportunities like this that come around often when they do. Uh, we have been very fortunate to be involved. Uh, we were fortunate to work with the city of Alamo Heights. This is a little more focus scale, but on a master plan for um, their municipal facilities. This is often a common challenge. I know we know it's a challenge that the city of Castle Hills faces as well, but uh, thinking deeply about how core city services can come together to better serve their residents. So uh, we were very fortunate to develop this plan with the city. Um, we're not the architects of the facility, but this is what allowed um, um, approval of uh, this facility uh, the, through voters uh, to happen and allowed the facility to become a reality. Um, and it, you know, oftentimes viewing these kind of city centers as new hubs, uh, new social hubs, um, but you can see it's, you know, becoming common to merge, you know, what does it mean to merge your fire station, your police station, and your city hall uh, for kind of a one-stop shop. Um, um, we, you know, we know that's of interest. Uh, similarly, at Terrell Hills, um, we were uh, fortunate to uh, work with them uh, on their plan, uh, their municipal plan, uh, and you can see a few things right off the bat. First is that we um, communicate graphically in a way that suits each um, each community, you know, uh, listening to how they respond to graphics and understand spaces, some uh, in a more kind of uh, three-dimensional way, others in a more um, hand-sketched way. So this is how the plan was communicated, 
was communicated for the Terrell Hill City Hall. Similarly, police, uh, fire, and administrative services coming together, able to impact a block of Terrell Hills uh, as much as we can. That was the opportunity there. The opportunity is obviously larger here with the city of Castle Hills. But just to say that that uh, these are two, you know, similarly sized cities encompassed by the city of San Antonio. Uh, and when there was a need, um, we were fortunate to be able to help them. That's a, a great, great building and facility if we've had the chance to um, visit there. Uh, we are currently working with the city of Pleasanton on a series of city blocks called the River Site on a redevelopment uh, for these blocks, um, envisioning a, a future that doesn't yet exist right now, but that aligns with their community. A wonderful uh, mixed use community hub where rodeos can be held, where uh, markets can be held, um, you know, where there's dining, uh, very active street fronts, fronts um, uh, the ability to have um, connected trailer parking, a dog park that suits the community. So uh, starting to move up and scale and look at how um, these plans impact multiple blocks instead of just um, a single uh, block. Uh, I mentioned earlier that LPA um, has offices in both Texas and in California. We've been fortunate to work in both states in a planning um, capacity um, for Orange County, where um, our uh, largest office is located, working with them on the heart of their city to better redevelop it, um, identifying opportunities around key commercial centers around their city hall, but most importantly, um, there was a significant lack of open space, of great active shaded open space. So the first thing that pops out is you see the, the proposed new landscape improvements and the trees. And that is really the figure um, uh, that was created for this particular plan. That's what we heard. That's what we heard from the city that mattered to them. So putting an emphasis on all of that between the road and the building and tying together these key amenities in, in the center of Orange County was really kind of the, the, the heart of that. Um, we sort of communicate along the way the larger themes um, for this master plan about how new plazas can be created around um, the city hall, for example, um, to create gathering spaces or hangout spaces. Maybe similarly, if you've been to the Pearl kind of lawn, how, to, how can you create that space within a city as a public amenity versus a um, developer amenity? Um, the city of Visalia, another great opportunity where um, the impetus for this particular plan was looking carefully at how water moves through their city, where the drainage infrastructure is, and celebrating that, about making that the active front um, for the city. So you can see that kind of Y shape that runs uh, west to east through the city and trying to al align that with uh, amenities that have infrastructure reasons like um, stormwater retention, but you wouldn't know it. Uh, they feel like parks um, as they, a butt right against um, the creek and the river there, amphitheaters, um, how to develop a better connection from the city hall um, to that creek. Um, so again, finding the focus, finding what's important uh, for the city of Vesalia and helping to implement that. And this is just a, kind of a snippet of how that works. Um, land use and planning guidelines are uh, more on the technical side of uh, planning efforts, but we were fortunate to work with uh, Moreno Valley on um, what it meant to have different speeds, different uh, amounts of lanes of traffic. And uh, frankly, it was a large um, office park. And um, those can be challenging. They can be unpleasant to, to drive through. Um, and the solution there was thinking more about um, topography and the section and how to shield what tend to be um, not the most attractive um, um, uh, factories and office building in Moreno Valley, um, where uh, the proposal was to, to uh, use um, landscape earthen berms to really create an experience along the sidewalk that's quite wide, that has walking trails built into it, but that screens um, the vehicular traffic and the experience of driving through this part of the city from the, these kind of not ideal buildings. Um, it was fun to articulate to them how, you know, day one, you might see a lot of small plants and shrubs in the ground on a hill, um, but over time, um, how that fills in and how that can create, um, you know, uh, a more beautiful um, route and path.
um, through the city that engages both people on this sidewalk here where they can jog um, and cars. Um, you know, uh, design guidelines um, can, uh, in some cases, be implemented in city plans. Um, still sort of talking about that, what does that mean uh, for the city, but those can help steer um, do's and don'ts for inappropriate locations for dumpsters, for um, architectural solutions, fake structure, things like that. Uh, trying to frown upon them. So that's just some experience that we do have um, around uh, planning uh, most recent projects. Um, that's right around 45 minutes um, and uh, you know, concludes our presentation. We wanna say thank you again and open the floor for any questions. And folks, as we wait for the questions, if y'all don't mind, I'm gonna pass around a sign in if you don't mind, thank you. I was noticing your zoning map um, that you had illustrated. We've got a lot of commercial development now developing uh, to the south of uh, Northwest Military Drive on West Avenue. Uh, I don't think that reflected the commercial along that, uh, that stretch of West Avenue. Uh, and I don't know whether that means that this commercial is, is now, um, uh, uh, situated on residential lots, residential zoning, or whether we just haven't updated our zoning. <laughs> it, you know, it could be a combination. Um, this is an exhibit that uh, we um, extracted from the city, um, but we will we will verify that. That's a good thing to point out. So you're talking about um, on West Avenue, uh, all the south. way from 410 to. Northwest Military, there's yeah. quite a bit of commercial now along the east side of West Avenue, and I don't think it's reflected in our zoning map. Yeah, so we'll have to double check that um, when we develop our existing conditions. Um, it's possible that whoever filled the colors in here didn't, um, didn't fill in each of these uh, when this exhibit was created by the city. Harry, I think it's old. I don't think it's been updated. That'll be another great outcome. We'll have an updated. Yes, for sure. <laughs> right. All right. Questions? I have a question. Um, guys, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it very much. Uh, one of the concepts that you introduced that sort of intrigued me was the idea of connections. And, um, you know, we're sort of a disparate city and with that big 410 cutting us in half, that would seem to make that pretty challenging, but you still pr feel pretty confident that we could achieve some sort of connecting the entire city together? Yeah, the problem of highways dividing cities is, a, uh, is not uncommon. Um, you happen to be almost divided in half by uh, 410, but where um, there are highway overpasses, there are opportunities um, because they do offer um, certain things uh, that are not, not common. They offer free shade, for example. They tend to connect major um, commercial spaces. And if you can think about um, you know, activating um, either side of the intersection and thoughtful interventions under the underpass itself, it can become a, a connector instead of a divider. Just to talk about streets, um, up until about 100 years ago, streets were where community life happened. They were, um, you know, before the car, they were narrower. They were um, where um, businesses, you know, uh, that's where families met. It's where, uh, uh, you know, businesses always wanted to align adjacent to streets. And it's only in the past hundred years that streets have become almost given solely um, to cars. Um, and the most extreme example of that is um, freeways and not only freeways, but under freeways. So um, if we heard that, and it sounds like we are hearing that that disconnection from the north to the south is a, is a problem for the city, we would look carefully at what's happening there and to think carefully about how the yeah, obviously there's text dot involved here, but how all of the turning is happening, how fast cars are moving, um, start there to identify where the opportunities are. To say we had studied that 
uh, those intersections fully right now would, would um, not be true, but it is a, uh, we can put a focus on that, certainly. So we do have some interesting opportunities under the bridge at Honeysuckle and then at West and Jackson Keller. There's a mm -hmm. huge amount of area right there. But, you know, what struck me when I was traveling this summer, we had the great fortune to go to Europe for three weeks. And, um, you know, Rome is a very old city. Venice is a very old city. Florence is a very old city. And in Venice, of course, you have no wheeled vehicles, which was quite lovely. Um, but in Rome, we were struck that the pedestrian crossings were in the middle of a road without any stoplights. And if there were pedestrians in it, the cars just stopped. It was fascinating. It was mm -hmm. so not American. But in, in Florence, they had some complete streets that were really um, the, the width of the whole area that had pedestrian and bike and road and car traffic was not huge because there's just not a lot of space. So you know, as Americans, we love our cars, but well, not so necessarily you, where we need to be. It, it's not money. It's not money into the city. Roads don't. Roads cost us money. They don't bring income or revenue into the city. Right. So. And you know, you bet. You touched on a lot of important urban planning topics there. Um, you talked about space um, and how sometimes having less space. Um, changes the dynamic between cars and uh, people. So um, a common trend in, in urban plans, if, if this is important, um, is how can we have appropriate vehicular speed next to people? And the people naturally drive faster in wider roads. They just do. Um, and it, they, so they call them road di diets or skinny streets is another term that's used. If you can tighten up a two lane road, um, and Byron will talk about this, but you know, to 21 feet or so, 20 feet, um, cars will naturally drive at a speed that's comfortable to, to be near pedestrians. They'll also be more on alert of pedestrians that are adjacent um, to the road. So um, it's actually not an American thing or a European thing that dictates the way people drive. It's the environment around it. Because if you were in a car driving there, you would react the same way. The, the environment and the planning um, shape people's behavior in cars and on sidewalks. So we, yeah, it's a really important thing to understand is that it, we drive differently, we walk differently in, in different places. The last thing that you mentioned that really stuck out is that you travel to places where you can walk. And- yeah. uh, We didn't actually, rent a car, it was train or walking or taxi. <laughs> Hid uh, a slide here. Uh, let me see if I can make this more legible. Just debating whether to, um, to bring this up, but, uh, you know, this is another quote from Peter Calthorpe. There's no great city that you don't enjoy walking in. Uh, you always go on vacation, almost always to places you can walk. So why, you know, why can't that be a goal for the city? That's an excellent point because we, <laughs> we, we always go places where we choose not to rent cars. Mm -hmm. It's fun. We'll call Uber or a taxi if we've got to go too far or use a metro. Now there are realities around the environment and heat and things like that, but there are hot cities where people walk, like uh, all throughout Spain, South Spain, Florence, et cetera. Rome. Mm -hmm. they were so They're hot. hot. <laughs> they were so hot. So hot. But everybody walks. <laughs> the gentleman asked if this is going to be on the website, and the answer is yes. Uh, Federico, if you please give me a, a PDF yep. of this thing, we'll get it on the website here in the mm -hmm. next day or so. We'll do. Right. Does anyone have any questions? Are you inspired by Fred, Fred, Federico's? I, I know I am. Every time he talks, he says something new that inspires me to, <laughs> you know, think about some new. I can't shout, so I, I need this. Sure. I, I have a question about growth. Uh oh, am I too close to it? Yeah. Okay. That's good. My question is about long term growth. If we're talking about a master plan, I should think we were concerned about growth in general. And in Castle Hills, we're not going to grow by annexing any land. And if we're going to keep up with the uh, growth that's projected for uh, this region of, of Texas, uh, by increasing our tax base and, and responding to 
other dynamics, it suggests that we should uh, have a policy and, and, and some sort of uh, reference to questions related to density uh, as, a, as a priority, which, which could mean, of course, building uh, residential skyscrapers uh, in the future as, as a possibility likelihood in Castle Hills. Um, I'm wondering how that fits into your concept of the comprehensive or master plan as it relates to growth. Are we talking about density as a means of, of uh, uh, sustaining uh, Castle Hills as a viable taxing entity? Okay, so that's that's a really great point because taxes are, are fundamental and, you know, the number of people in a city directly equates to um, the tax base. So um, the, the first thing we would want to do is understand, is increased density a desire for the city of Castle Hills? Is that something um, you obviously have, you have a fixed footprint, you have a fixed number of properties. Um, there is a, a limit, right, to what can happen in, in the footprint. Um, we would want to understand, is that a desire for the city to grow the number of citizens, to increase the base, or um, is the desire to keep the current density but find other ways of increasing your, your, um, your tax base because, and, or do you want to increase your tax base? So we need to have those conversations with you. We want to hear from you. It would be completely inappropriate to bring a, a, a concept to you about what we think is important without hearing from you first. It, the, what we hear from you will directly shape whether or not multifamily um, is something that, that uh, is an appropriate you know, zoning uh, to, to expand, to hold steady, or to contract in the long term. Um, one of the fundamental qualities of the city of Castle Hills is the beautiful single family homes that you drive through, each with their own character, depending on which of the six neighborhoods are in. Um, that, you know, that likely won't change. That will always be at the heart of anyone looking to live in Castle Hills. Um, but what we do around the edges, you know, we would love to hear from you and the city about your thoughts on that, um, instead of imposing that um, upon you. Who was that gentleman that just spoke up? Because I couldn't hear him on my screen. Is he in the city hall? Uh, or is he on his own uh, virtual? Because uh, the, if he's in City Hall speaking at the podium, uh, the, the uh, microphone is not allowing us to, to hear uh, the questions that he had. Well, he's here in City Hall, Barry. Um, but I might mention that one of our discussions on Saturday at nine o'clock on Saturday pertaining to the gentleman's question, perhaps, is a discussion on uh, economic development. And I think that's kind of where you are headed. And we're going to have a couple of folks who know a whole lot about that. Just help us understand what that means. What does it mean? And um, how does it how is it accomplished? What are some of the options for going there? And then we as a community can debate whether or not we like any of those ideas. Um, as Federico suggested, we may or may not decide that growth is something we want to do. But density, in, increased density, is certainly a way to a higher tax base. But it's, you know, we, we'll have the opportunity to debate all of that as the process unfolds. And I should say that one common trend that uh, is observed in urban planning is that um, what tends to lead um, growth, commercial growth, is housing growth first. Mm -hmm. um, so when people move to a place, they demand more. There is a benefit to having more people. Um, when, when you see an increase in housing in, let's say, a, a city center, for example, the businesses follow, and then the families follow. And those families also tend to demand more from their schools, the schools being the last domino to fall in that kind of three-step process. So um, there is um, uh, effects, I will say, whether you view them as pros or cons of, of density, there are effects to them. Excellent questions and discussion. Any other 
All right, we've got about three more minutes. Any questions from anyone online? If you don't want to speak, you can throw something in the chat. Amy, this is Agdell. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, Federico and uh, Leo, right? Uh, great job, great presentation. Uh, I am part of the committee and uh, and uh, I, uh, I think uh, I really like what you mentioned about um, connectivity. Uh, you know, I, I really think that um, I think it's one of the most important parts here uh, to me. It, it's, it's connectivity. The Castle Hills is, is so central. We're so divided. You know, we're so disconnected. You know what I mean? I live no, just north of, uh, of 410, you know, kind of like 410 in, in, in local Selma. And it's, you know, uh, you know, and we love our streets and, 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 and our neighborhoods, but it's so hard to get, like, let's say from my house to the other side of 410 you know to the commercial areas and things like that so um i'm extremely uh uh i guess you know i, I really want to see what we come up with as the community uh, when it comes to community uh connectivity uh and i'm also uh very interested in in you know in just seeing how we could could connect to uh Harbico park for example uh i i work for the parks department i'm a project manager and and i oversee the design and construction of the the Howard W. Peak Green System. So uh, that's what I've been doing for the past 14 years. And in a, in a, in a couple of months, uh, uh, two major creeks are going to meet, you know, the Leon and Salado. So, you know, we're going to have 40 miles of continuous trails. Uh, so it is so important for us to get to Harburger Park safely through Northwest Military. Once we get to Northwest Military, we have access to, we'll, we'll have access to 40 miles of greenway trails mm -hmm. and once for sam is connected which is going to happen in a couple of years we'll have almost 80 miles of trails uh that will be accessible to us we just have to find a way to get safely to harburger park so i'm really excited to just to see the ideas that we come up with as a community i'm very interested in 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 uh in complete streets and i think uh northwest military has a lot of potential you know, we don't have a lot of land here in, in, in Castle Hills to do parks or, 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 you know, different things, but we do have a lot of right away, as you mentioned uh, earlier. You know, uh, Northwest Military is super wide, and I think that it could be better utilized, you know, uh, you know and, and implement some complete streets with, you know, more shade, more trees, you know, uh, uh, protected bike lanes, and, and just finding a way to connect to, you know, to the, the city of San Antonio's parks, you know, and, and be able to have uh, access to uh, the Greenway system. But again, thank you so much. I really, uh, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. It was, was great. Thank you. Great. Can't wait to hear everything thank you, you about the park system. I look forward to working with you. Thanks. We do have one more question. My name is Gary Houston. I wanted to raise one other issue that I didn't hear discussed, and I know uh, Saturday is the transportation session, but just in case I can't make it to that one, I wanted to broach the question now uh, so that it might be uh, considered as, uh, and factored into that discussion then, and that's the question of the hazardous materials route mm. that, that uh, uh, Castle Hills, as you know, is uh, divided by, by the hazardous material materials route along Loop 410. Uh, and it's something that that uh, I think probably shouldn't have happened to begin with, but I'm I'm curious what the, uh, the, the sense of the community is uh, about that threat uh, of uh, some sort of disaster near the airport or uh, in the middle of our city uh, that uh, could could end up uh, uh, affecting um, the quality of our lives pretty uh, substantially. I, I get nerve. I live a block away from the loop, and every time I hear air brakes, I uh, <laughs> shudder. <laughs> and it, it's an issue that I think uh, ought to be discussed, and uh, and that we we get some sort of uh, community consensus about. Uh, I have not heard that discussion before, and. Uh, I, I admit to perhaps being out of the loop, but I, I, I'd love to, to hear the council and the community 
go on the record about how we feel about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, those were good points. I think various times we have all kind of worried about it. Um, and I know as part of the city hazard mitigation plan, there is some discussion of it, but I think it bears out knowing um, citizen input on how much that affects your feeling of health and safety and whether you feel like we need to do more. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, well, we're at 7.32, so we are into the next time period. Federico, Leonardo, Byron, thank you guys so much for joining us this evening and starting us off. I think that was a great, um, perfect primer for getting us started because you really are so enthusiastic about, at least I feel you are enthusiastic about what you do for a living and it really breathes, it, it comes through in your presentations to, to us. So. Thank you so much for bringing your excitement and talents to us this Thank evening. Thank you for the op opportunity. Look forward to uh, planning together. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Well, you know, you're more than welcome to stay, but it is a Tuesday night. So you have <laughs> up other things that you probably would like to do. So um, with that, I am going to start our next presentation. Um, and I'm going to go backwards just a little bit. Um, and we are going to go through the citizen citizen survey, but I want to, um, I want you to see a little bit more of what we have done as a committee so far. It doesn't seem like an awful lot. We're really in the second kind of major stage where you would see visually what we've been up to. Um, early on, we decided that we were calling this endeavor "Create Castle Hill" and that we're determining our future excellence. Um, we started with a lot of words and worked really hard to distill this down into something that we thought was catchy, but but um, tells a story of what we're trying to do as citizens. So our committee is made up of myself, I'm the chairman, Amy McLenn, Moretta Scott is the vice chair, Jack Joyce is our council representative, Skip McCormick is our parks and project liaison, as well as Ray Schultz, who's also our parks and projects liaison. Barry Middleman, um, Agdell Rivera, and Bruce Smiley Califf are also members, and Stacia Sprigden is a member, but she has moved um, and is no longer active on the committee. This is our mission. We worked really hard to kind of figure out what our purpose was, and so we came up with a mission statement to help, help keep us grounded, and I'll let you read this. I think it is also on the city's website. So if I click to the next slide too fast and <laughs> you haven't read through it, um, it's on the city's website. We felt that there was a lot included, you know, a lot that we need to include and address for our city. So we feel like our mission is chock full of things that we have heard from neighbors and friends in the city that are important to them. So um, we have a vision statement. I don't know if you knew that or not. Several years ago, council adopted a vision statement for our city, and that's not really what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, but I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about really some fundamental things that we thought as a committee were really important. That the number one thing is that this must be citizen focused. The, um, the driving force behind all of the dialogue and what we, what we produce is going to be citizen focused. It's not what any one of us want. It's not what council wants. It's what the citizens as a collective really want for the future of our city. We want a roadmap. Um, we have heard time and time again, or we have experienced as we've been on council or committees, um, most of the people on our committee have actually served either as aldermen on city council or have served on the board of adjustment or the architectural review committee or the zoning commission. And so time and time again, we found that we didn't really have anything to help us back up our decisions as far as what citizens wanted. And so we had to make decisions based on what was in front of us, which wasn't always um, easy because it, it would be just nice. It would nice. It would be nice to know what citizens want and have that roadmap. So that's a big focus of this group because we all saw where that would have been helpful. We want to improve community health and safety, incorporate a unifying vision for the city, but what you'll see towards the end of this part of the slides is that we have six very unique neighborhoods that have similar problems and similar, and similar um, 
likes, but they're all very unique. Uh, we have a lot of citizens that in the past have spent time on master plans or comprehensive plans. And it's our goal to utilize all of that work so that it doesn't go to waste. And this is mostly an in-house effort. We have some funding um, that is going to buy some time from Federico and Leonardo and Byron to help us put together a professional plan. But for the most part, this is being, uh, the work is being done by the committee uh, pro bono. We also want something attractive and easy to read. And our goal is to include some sort of a, amendment mechanism so that in the future, the plan can be amended and we don't, don't ever have to go back to ground zero. So as we do periodic citizen surveys or host um, focus groups, the plan can be amended to change different areas without ever having to go back to the drawing board and start at zero because it's a time consuming process. And then we want to include assessment and implementation mechanisms and create accountability so that it's actually used by council and the committees. Um, and so the work doesn't go to waste and your input doesn't go to waste. Um, this is really out of date. We've, we've lost our track a little bit, but we're still plugging forward. The citizen survey is what this section is really about, and this is my stats for that. We have 1,760 households in Castle Hills. That's the number of postcards we mailed out back in January. We had 240 households respond, which is 13.63%. And we had 57 of those responses offered to help with the process. So we were pleased as a committee with the percentage of input, and that was really just the starting point um, you know, now this is a little bit of an education point, and then we'll really get into some hands-on with the maps, and um, I'm excited about the October workshops with Federico and Leonardo. Okay, and we're here. I'm gonna go to this part. So we have some neighborhood visualiz visualization points, and these are things that we will work on later, um, every area of town we've got wow which is west of west we've got the edge which is the area between lock hills helm and northwest military we have midtown which is the area around city hall that's not included in either of those other outside zones the estates is the um, hot pink area on the map the terrace is the orange or the yellowy kind of goldenrod color on the map and the southern cone is that kind of um, hot green, like pale uh, seafoam green kind of color, which is the very southern tip of the city. Um, we also sometimes refer to the northern part of the city as Nolo or the north of the loop or Solo, south of the loop. And we, um, moons ago in a different committee, thought that having some names would be good to create identity and um, kind of some fun regarding our cities. So let me stop this one and I want to go through our citizen survey because it is um, really pretty awesome. All right, so I would love to be able to get this bigger. I don't think I can. Oh, yes, I can. All right, there we go. All right, so. Our citizen survey was quite lengthy, but like I just, just described, we had quite a few responses. Um, we conducted the survey in February. Like I said, we received the 240 responses. Um, response rate of 11.7, and I had 13 on the other side. So we're in that 11 to 13% um, range. Three surveys were done by hand, all the rest were done online through the SurveyMonkey app that we had. And then that, those, in, those answers were input into the computer so that everything, we had a, a solid basis for the rest of the data that's in this, product, in this slideshow. The, we are waiting for the 2020 census results to come out and we will be able to include that in our, master, in our comprehensive plan this time. Some, the res, the uh, results from the survey were somewhat weighted towards families with children, 60% uh, of the people that responded have children and approximately 22% of Castle Hills have children per the uh, American Community Survey or the U.S. Census Bureau information. So it's quite interesting that it seems like those of us that have children really um, are taking an interest in where our city is headed. 
this is the this was the first major initiative of the comp plan besides um you know before we got to the speakers forum and then our interactive workshops that we will be having okay 2019 our population was 4447 compared to 4198 from the 1990 census about a six percent increase so this will be some interesting um, discussion to have regarding whether we like those numbers. If you hit the magic threshold of 5,000, you can become a home rule city versus a general law city. And that's got a whole host of new responsibilities and new things that you can do. So that is probably something that we need to discuss as citizens is whether we want to try to hit the threshold to have a different governing structure for our city. The preliminary review suggests that we have a younger population, but we are waiting on the 2020 census results to figure out whether that bears to be true or not. Let's see, the vast majority of people own their homes versus renting. 78% of respondents prefer to stay in Castle Hills once they're, um, stay in their home as they age. And the majority of respondents have attended events at the Commons, so these are citizens who have figured out to, how to plug in to different things. We as a committee thought it was important to ask some information about COVID. Um, it won't be the last time we ever deal with a pandemic, pandemic, I'm sure. So we figured that getting some information would be helpful in helping our fire department, police department, and city council and city um, staff help prepare for future events. So we had family um, health affected. We asked about health and finances. This whole presentation is posted on the city's website, so you can go back and look at those things that you find most interesting. Some 30% said finances were um, impacted. And then we asked questions about Zoom or in-person. And I think really what we're finding is that a hybrid, I'm so happy with the number of people we have tonight. I think we're up over 20 at this point. So I'm really excited that we've drawn so much interest in, in the planning this time. Um, what do you love most about your areas? Um, hands down, and, and I think most people who have served on commissions or council would tell you that we have a great love for our trees, the country feel, the rural atmosphere. That was overwhelming. 92 respondents responded with some sort of comment in, the, in, the, in that subject matter. It's no surprise either that we love our public services, police, fire, sanitation. 54 people responded that that was what they loved most large lots, friendly people, central location, quiet access and character of homes, you know, all fell with a, a sizable amount of responses, plus sense of community, some walkability. Um, I don't think anybody is surprised by it, but it's interesting to start putting numbers to it with how the percentages of 92 goes down to 54, and then you go down from there. So those are certainly things that we need to consider as we go forward. Neighborhood discussion, okay, that's just putting it in a graph form. Biggest threat, this was also something very important. We wanted to have kind of a, a baseline for what people think the biggest problems are. Poorly maintained streets got 34 response, 39 responses, crime 34, traffic issues, which is everything from speeding, cut throughs, that was 32. Subdividing large lots, 21, poorly maintained homes, 19, lack of planning, 15, high property taxes, 11, and Oak Wilt, um, eight. So these are certainly all things that we need to make sure as we go through that we um, get people's opinions on and see where we stand and how we address these as part of the comp plan. And then graph form, graph form. All right, what do you want to preserve within your area? Um, pretty much tracks with this last question. And now graft. What would you see, what would you like to see preserved or improved? We have the lifestyle, quaint character trees being at the top of the list, streets, infrastructure, public spaces, business, um, police, public works, community, uh, communication and public facilities. So we've got a list of things that people feel are important to be preserved or improved. So that bears out to um, have some discussion and that's graphed here. 
Then we had some specific questions about city services. Over 80% 80, 80 of the respondents scored our police department, fire department, garbage pickup and recycling in the nine to 10 range. And there were some um, on the lower side. Let's see, code enforcement scores were a little bit lower. They really kind of fall sort of in the middle. Street maintenance is really kind of a, a nice bell curve right there with mostly in the middle. And then code enforcement um, has some more on the low end. Okay, what would you like to see that we don't have now? Um, annual bulk collection, compost containers, hazmat, haz hazardous material pickup, a library, um, elderly assistance, coordination, online permit services, playground, or community pools. So we have some lofty goals and some things that would be pretty easy to um, handle, but it, it, these are all items that we can do, that we can address in our visioning and our workshops in October. What changes would you like to make to zoning regulations to preserve neighborhoods or encourage desirable growth? And this we knew would be a challenging question because zoning is really difficult to really understand. Um, it is uh, challenging even once you've been to several classes on zoning to understand how important it is and how picky, picky, picky it is that if you don't have the rule in place, you can't do anything. So um, there were a few suggestions and that is our next topic tonight is zoning. So I will leave discussion of that until later this evening. So let's see. Same thing with special uses or variances that, that goes along with zoning. And a lot of that has to do with the way laws are written or how they're not written. And if it says it, you can do it. And if it doesn't, you can't or you, you know, so a lot of times a committee or a council's tie, hands are tied when it comes to zoning or land use issues because we just don't have the statutes to support maybe what citizens really want to see in an area. So that's an, a very, very important part of this comp plan process is to educate everyone what zoning's purpose is and land use purpose is and then elicit responses on what we as citizens want in the city and then we can turn that into recommendations on how to give council and the committees and, and uh, commissions their tools they need to do their jobs. Same thing with the architectural review board. Um, if the laws aren't in place they can't do much. If they don't have the power they can't do much. Economic development we had um, kind of an interesting range of people responding regarded limited tax exempt development, commercial development, residential development. Um, let's see, funding versus bond elections versus increased property taxes versus certificates of obligation, which the city is actually using right now to very effectively um, manage some street and drainage projects. And then higher priority, other improvements by the city or infrastructure. And I, for one, wish we'd had a third, third category, which was both, um, because I would have probably picked both. And so in hindsight, maybe we messed up a little bit on this question and should have had a, I like it all, you know, I want it all um, kind of concept. So that is, in a nutshell, the survey results. We have identified some themes that um, our demographics have changed that we like our heavily treed rural appearance of our neighborhoods and our public services, large lots, central location and quiet neighborhoods. So those are clearly things that we need to try to protect. But we worry about street crime, streets, crimes, traffic, poorly maintained yards and homes. And every area is different. And we hear just a little bit different um, what you like and what, what the threats are in each of the six areas. And, but overall, we do see in the responses that citizens would like to see responsible development, whether that's business, commercial, or residential. And so maybe it's a function of just proposing that we need to look at some statutes or ordinances that need to be, um, or ordinances that need to be adopted in the future. So that is the end of um, the survey. What I would like to do is show you a picture of um, my favorite complete street that I have seen. Is there a picture up? 
or is it still the survey? Amy, you're, you're not sharing your screen at all. Okay. Oh, not at all? Nope. Oh, no. That's why I was wondering, that's why I put in chat that uh, and I didn't uh, see we it. didn't see any graphics. Oh, fiddlesticks. Well, let me go back. Do you see something now? Yes. Ay, caramba. Well, that's not good. Let me flip through this real quick. I think I just lost everything on my screen. Let me go down to some of the graphics because they are. Yeah, why don't you go to the charts where the folks are commenting on the neighborhoods. I think that's kind of the heart of it. Okay, so I'm going to skip past the COVID responses because it was, it was important to us as a committee, but I think that most everyone's um, interest lies in, in things such as this, where we were asking about what people loved about their areas, and there were some overarching trends, like overwhelmingly people like the trees, the country field, the rural atmosphere, and we love our city services, police, fire, sanitation, large lots, friendly people. Um, and all of that. And then that graphically looks like this. Oh, shoot, sorry about that. I should have put this in a PowerPoint. It would have been easier to flip through. So that's everything on a chart. Um, which is, you know, graphically, sometimes it's nice to see the numbers stacked against each other in a line versus the numbers, because you can really see that we do have some overwhelming um, themes and what people want and whether you know the city has the tools they need to help us support that vision is a different story sometimes so the threats were important to us as well as i mentioned before streets crime traffic and then graphically here's what that looks like um oak wilt is mainly a problem over in the edge but i worry that eventually it will jump the highway or, or somebody will have their trees cut by someone and they'll come over to my part of town in the estates and and then we'll have trouble too or that it'll jump northwest military and we've just got a problem all over town so um it's interesting to see the trends on the graphs it's nice to have both the words and the graph let me go down to a couple of the other ones um these were areas that people wanted to improve Preserve, um, preserving the character of things was also important to us as a committee. So um, public facilities, everything to, again, we have the quaint character trees kind of being an overwhelming ideal that, that citizens really like that we're different because of our trees and our, the size of our lots and how quiet we are even with four tents. <laughs> um, garbage and, and police department, their rankings, Code enforcement and street maintenance, a little bit different. More of a bell curve with the street maintenance and code enforcement, kind of in the middle as well. Um, this is on the website, on the city, um, city of Castle Hills website, so you can pull it up and, and peruse through it, print a copy, make notes, or, or just make notes and bring it to our visioning statement or our visioning workshops in October. Land use, um, we have zoning coming up in about 30 minutes and so I'm going to leave much discussion of zoning to that presentation. It is a, a not a hard concept once you understand it but it's difficult to understand the importance and it, it relies a lot on ordinances and statutes and rules that are in place and so if you don't have them you can't accomplish necessarily what you want to. So we'll have a fair amount of discussion over the process of developing the comprehensive plan, um, a lot of discussion related to zoning or how zoning can be used to help us accomplish what we want to see as citizens. And then funding, um, preferences, bond election, increased property taxes, certificates of obligation. Like I said, we're already using some of the CFOs. And higher priority. This is the one where I wish there'd been a catch all C, I want it all, like Veruca Salt. <laughs> Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, anyway, and then the overarching thing. So this is this is my new favorite simple. Um, 
Let me share my screen. Complete street, super simple. Um, not very wide. I would say that maybe this was as wide as Antler or um, trying to think of another street that's pretty wide. Maybe about the size of Antler. So this was um, Arno River in Florence walking pedestrian path, bicycle two-way path, and then street, the cars two-way path. And then of course they have bicycle stoplights and car stoplights, and there was some crossing over, but it was really simple. And you had these curves that created, uh, curves that created buffers between cars and people, um, which made it quite safe if you were over here as a, a person traveling. So anyway, and of course they were recycling cans all over the place too, but anyway. That is, I apologize that I didn't have the screens up. I, I um, guess I didn't share my screen right. Screen right. Amy, if I may, uh, I think that this, the, the uh, graphics, uh, you kind of went through them pretty quick, uh, uh, sharing your screen. But I think people will, that uh, are not on our committee probably wanted to see the distinguishable fit factors in the different uh, 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 various portions of of the neighborhoods, the edge, oh. the, the things okay. of that nature. They saw the color graphics, but I don't think they were able to really associate them with. Do you want me to go back to this one? Pardon? Do you want me to go back to this one where we'd kind of developed some visioning aspects or to the survey results, Barry? Which one? And well, I think it's it's it's. It's what the survey showed by neighborhood. Okay. Uh, in other words, associating the neighborhood with the with the uh, likes and dislikes by various okay. neighborhoods. Let me go back to that one. Share screen. Where is my? There we go. All right. Well, this one we didn't divide up by like um, by neighborhood. Is the survey responses back up the survey summary? Okay, so this one is we'll go back to this one. Love what you love most. So to me, this tells me these are things that we don't want to mess with. And then here's the graphic of what that looks like. Let's see if I can get it to where you can see everything. There we go. Any comments, questions, curiosities about the results? I don't know where my um, my chats went. So those are the likes. I think the threats are equally as telling, but what was interesting is that Every part of town had a traffic issue, but they were different traffic issues. So for instance, the edge has a hard, hard time with cut throughs. There are parts of the terrace that have trouble with cut throughs. Um, like in the estates, we hear a lot of the racing down Blanco and 410. So to us, that was more of a concern. And then for other areas, it was speeding or it was, um, red light runners or that sort of thing. So while it, generically we could classify them as traffic issues, they were very distinct. You know, it could be in the areas that border 410, it was the noise from just traffic on 410. So, you know, or noise barrier is something we need to talk with. But those, uh, am I off on mute? You're off, I can hear you. Amy, uh, that's what I'm asking about this A1, a two, A three, A four. 
are those the neighborhood sections? Uh, no. The colors, or t can you explain? No. So, are? so I think what Ray and Yvette did is they took the responses. So, poorly maintained streets, crime, traffic issues, and they took these responses and they turned them into a graph, into a bar chart. And so this is 39, this is 34, this is 33. So it's looking at it in words and then it's looking at the same information. So this isn't divided by area so much as it is just as a city as a whole, as a whole, we had more people respond that poorly maintained streets were a concern. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think we divided out the data. I don't think there was a way to divide out the data that specifically. We did, um, I suppose what speaks more to that would be this. Did I share my other screen? Uh, fiddle -dee -dee. This one, can you see that west of west, is it up on the screen? I lost my chat spot, so I can't tell. No, nothing's on the screen. Okay, then I did it wrong again. Except your beautiful face. Oh, man. Let me see. Let's try this again. Now, is there something? Yeah. Yes. Okay, there we go. So I think this is what we were able to distill from that information. We were able to kind of generally analyze that in the west of west area, which is, um, you know, everything west of West Avenue, that they have large acreage lots and so that's the area where we've got the rural residential zoning designation that council just approved um, but they do have traffic issues with st george um, so what can we do to address that and then what about zoning along west avenue related to the commercial developments because that always brings up some problems that what do we do about an area that's become quite commercial? Um, how do you create buffers? Do you do dual zoning? So there's some tension between residential and commercial development in that area. In the edge, which is Northwest uh, or Lock Hill Selma to Northwest Military, and it uh, is bordered by West in the North and 410 in the South. The cut through traffic is a common theme that we see uh, complaints from people in that area. And then is it possible to do a linear park in the concrete drainage channel? So is there a way to create some com community space with just the existing easements and drainage that we have in the area? And then they, there's also common complaint about oak wilt and concern about that. What do we do about that? Midtown, that's the area around City Hall. Um, this is also walkability, bikeability, landscaping, maybe something along Northwest Military, developing exhibits for possibly converg conversion of the drainage channels into a linear park there. The drainage in the edge actually goes under 410 and then continues in a big drainage channel that goes down, um, crosses Castle and, and um, oh man, my geography right now is, I'm losing the names of the streets. But anyway, it goes kind of through the middle of Midtown. There's a really um, wide, unimproved drainage channel that ends up at Wisteria. And then maybe there's a way to beautify the shopping centers with landscaping or encourage a uniform architectural style along Northwest Military. So you really, when you hit that section of Northwest Military, you know you're in Castle Hills. Like there's, you don't see a sign necessarily, but you just, the development has a feel. So that's, kind of a dreamy um, visualization point. The estates is the um, larger lot area of the, of the Southern Loop. We have no sidewalks on um, parts of Blanco and Honeysuckle does not have sidewalks, but yet that goes straight to City Hall and one of the elementary schools. So what do we need to do to increase mobility? Um, castles in Blanco, if you, don't ever go through there. You don't ever go when the light turns red because, or green because somebody runs it one out of every five times. So we've got red light runners right there. And then noise barriers along 410. There's the brick wall, but it's not perfect for noise um, cancellation. 
the terrace, they have a problem with um, some cut through traffic on, on Gladiola, noise barriers along I-10, it's pretty noisy there. There is um, no sidewalk along parts of Jackson Keller, and maybe that's another area where we could have a, a linear park with the drainage channel that exists to connect our two parts of, of Castle Hills. And then maybe some strategic rezoning in that area where there are a lot of duplexes across from Lee High School is an area where if you're identifying are the buffers we have appropriate for keeping crime out. Um, crime is a, is a particular interest in that part of town because of the apartments across the street. So is there a way we can better protect and insulate or is, not isolate but insulate us from problems? And then the Southern Cone, or SoCo, has a lot of commercial development down in the southern part of it. So is there a way to do something similar with landscaping and architectural style like um, like you'd have along Northwest Military? So the city seems like a whole. I know a lot of people are shocked to find out that the shopping center with the uh, Los Treos Fruteria and that area that that's Castle Hills. They just don't know that the city goes down that far because it doesn't seem like there's, you know, it doesn't seem like it fits with everything else. And then there are areas where there are no sidewalks up both sides, especially along Jackson Keller. I rode my bicycle one day and found that, you know, there's drainage ditch, but there's no sidewalk, which was kind of scary. Um, and also, are, are there places where we could have some pocket parks or linear parks to where we create a, a unified city? So these were just some high level visu visualization points that the committee came up with to illustrate what this process could possibly do for our different areas of town and to illustrate that everyone has a different problem or has a different, um, you know, beauty spot that we want to keep. So with that, I would love to turn it over for questions because um, that's enough for me. <laughs> Turn it on. Uh, any questions about the process that we've used so, so, so far or um, kind of where we're headed in the process. I just like to applaud you all for all the work that you've done to put this together and the effort that it has gone into all of this and the thoughtfulness that you've put into it. I, it, it means a lot. So, and I'll also say that, you know, sometimes you have to make the best decisions you can looking at the big picture and look at the whole community and whether I have my street and I want this and Barry's on his street and he wants that. You know, it doesn't work that way all the time. We don't get to have everything we want and somebody has to be the one to say, this is what we need to do. And we're looking out for everybody in the community. And I think you, you kind of go down a path of, oh, well, let's do this because Denise wants that or, you know, Denise and her friends want this. And I think you gotta just stay steady. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the whole uh, from now till Saturday afternoon where all this goes and I just appreciate what you've done and I'll mute myself again now but anyway good for you good for all of y'all for what you've Thank done you, the Denise. talent that you have you're welcome I will pass that along to the committee at our next meeting next week that that I know that everyone it's very rare you get some pats on the back and I will make sure that I give everyone the pat on the back those, well, um, you all have done the legwork, you've done the homework, and you've got some inside, insight and inside into all of this. And it's not like, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this together. You're doing this with everybody, but still somebody has to be the one to say, the buck has to stop. So I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. Well, it doesn't sadly. I'm on your that. side. <laughs> I support you. Whatever you do is what I'm saying, because you're doing it. And we're sitting here reaping the benefits of it. Okay, now I am going to mute myself. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate the comments as well in the in the chat. It's we we have a great committee. I have to brag on my committee. We have a standing rule. Um, we meet almost every other to every other Wednesday at noon on Zoom. We have not had a single meeting in person. We have met via Zoom from the very beginning because we started all this during COVID. And we start at noon and we end at one. And if we got through the whole agenda, great. If we didn't get through the agenda, well, we just don't talk as much the next time. So 
I've had a really, uh, the committee is great. We keep each other on task and hope that we're pushing us in the direction where everyone feels like they've got a little finger, a little thumbprint or a fingerprint on this plan when it comes out at the end. So we've still got 19 minutes for this segment. Um, do we have any other questions, discussions? I don't know if our speakers are here early that we could start early if we don't have any questions. Amy, this is Ryan. The next presenter is online right now. Oh, excellent. Well, if everyone online would like to go ahead and get started with the next presentation, then um, we can finish just a bit early then, if there are no other questions. All right, look look in the near future for the dates related to the workshops. They, my understanding is that they'll both be run with the same information, so you don't have to go to both. It's go to one or go to the other, whichever one fits in your schedule. And it's an hour and a half. Um, Federico is the professional and he has advised us that that is all the bandwidth we have on a weeknight for, um, you know, for, for really keeping people engaged and active. So look for those dates and, and do try to, try to come and see us um, at one of those. I'm sure we'll have another flyer and you'll get something else on your door. <laughs> we'll beat the pavement again. All right, thanks for joining tonight on this one. Ryan, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker. And if I may, I'll, uh, I'll introduce Wendell. Wendell, are you ready to go? You're muted. Muted. Yes, I am. All right, thank you. Um, do you need to, uh, do you have your presentation with you that you can share or do you want us to project it here? Uh, I think I'd like for you to project it if you could. Okay. I mean, I don't have a share uh, feature here that, that I know of. Okay. Very good. So folks, this is our uh, conversation on zoning. We're gonna have, uh, if all goes as planned, we're gonna have three speakers. Wendell Davis, who was a planner for many years here in the San Antonio and Texas area, um, and has got tremendous insight into all aspects of planning. And actually he and I have had the privilege of working together on some higher ed stuff a few years ago. But in any event, we, we've invited Wendell to kind of give us some of the basics of zoning. What is it? Why do we have it? How does it help cities? What does it do? How do you change it? You know, those kind of basic things. And then we've invited uh, Councilman Joe Isbrand to uh, offer some commentary on uh, his experience as chair of the Zoning Commission a few years back and just see if there is any Castle Hill specific insight that he might like to add to it. And uh, similarly, we've invited the current chair of zoning, Juan Solis, to offer similar comments. So uh, if we start a little bit early, uh, we might be a little bit ahead of Joe and Juan, but I suspect that um, Wendell's presentation will, uh, will take more than 15 minutes. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> You want me to start now? Okay, yeah, please, please zone it. Okay. So I have to... uh, well, this is about zoning. I, I'm not sure where Castle Hills is in the zoning uh, scheme of things. Uh, I looked on your website. I didn't see anything about zoning. Um, I know that uh, if you're a... a uh, Not a general law, but a, uh, what's the word? A, five, a city of 5,000 and have a charter, then you can have zoning and do anything you want to that's not prohibited by the state. Uh, uh, a home rule city. Uh, so uh, let's go back to what is it? Uh, the second slide. Sorry, Wendell, we got an amateur running the show here. Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> You're not an amateur. You should know better. 
Okay, that's it. What is zoning? Well, it's, you know, it's an ordinance uh, in a community. It's a law that organizes how land can be used. Uh, you usually, uh, you start with a land plan, uh, but if you don't, you still need your orderly development pattern. And uh, it basically your zone, your zoning, uh, the zones of zoning are basically uh, telling you uh, what can be built uh, or what not can what cannot be built on a piece of property. And uh, in a city uh, with zoning, uh, usually all land is zoned except for the public rights of way. So let's go to the next one. Uh, we have it so we can keep uh, compatible uses together, or if we want to, we can uh, we can uh, uh, differentiate. Uh, if we want to intermingle uses, we can do that. But that's uh, but that's a possibility with zoning. Uh, if you want to maintain a certain look, uh, you can do that with through your zoning code. Um, zoning will establish the height uh, the bill of the buildings and the setbacks from the street setbacks from the side yards or from the rear and uh usually uh you know we're talking about zoning for uh preserving primarily started to pre preserve the character of uh, single family neighborhoods you uh in fact zoning let's go to the next slide it really reveres a single family uh, it really works uh, if you've got a, a land plan, um, but you have to, you need some kind of schemes, a pattern, predetermined pattern so that you'll know uh, where to zone. Sometimes let's just say if you started with uh, a town that's halfway built out, you had no zoning, you would probably uh, inventory all the properties and figure out what they were. In fact, if you went to the appraisal district, you could get all the existing land uses and prepare a, a map of uh, existing land use. And if you wanted to uh, zone those things as they were, you could do that. Um, if an incompatible use is proposed, a zoning comes in handy if uh, somebody proposes it and they, you can consider whether or not it is, uh, should be included uh, or should be zoned the, the, for the, proposed zoning and it only works if it's enforced otherwise zoning is not very useful going to go to the next slide okay well it doesn't work in certain uh basically for certain uses and for certain uh activities uh, it doesn't work very well around airports because uh you know the noise uh the height restrictions the limitations that uh, airports want to impose on the land surrounding them and the courts uh, have all, almost always go with the zoning rather the the city's zoning rather than with what the airport wants so that's it doesn't work very well like that so what uh, San Antonio has is an airport overlay zone which um, imposes additional restrictions um primarily within maybe a noise cone or within a thousand two thousand five thousand feet of the uh runway that doesn't work very good with sex businesses it's kind of hard to uh identify the land use there and uh, make it legal so that's another uh special okay uh, situation that uh, can't be really dealt with with conventional zoning signs uh, uh you probably you i think you do have a sign ordinance and it couldn't be handled with zoning uh because of all the things that are related to it uh churches and schools i'm not always sure about this one uh churches and schools are often just uh allowed by right in uh, residential zones so uh it, they are difficult to categorize and so they you know they they're pretty hard to do with zoning what what would you zone uh certain uh churches or, or schools to be uh then historic districts because they are a special situation and they need special protections uh we uh san antonio has historic overlay uh, zones which imposes additional restrictions 
uh, within that zone to take care of the historic uh, district problem. Uh, it doesn't work very good in uh, floodplains or other environmentally sensitive land because you uh, they're, they're just so vast and so different. But uh, what, what we learned is that performance uh, zoning works much better in uh, some of these cases. Now, a zoning is the use of the city's use of police power. Uh, the primary and early reasons for zoning has been to uh, the justification to protect um, public health, safety, and welfare. And uh, the power, this power for zoning is enforced always at the local level. And uh, this, the scope of the zoning authority is very significant because it is, uh, it really imposes on uh, your individual rights. Next slide, um, zoning requirements. Next slide, two, uh, two documents. You've got your zoning map and you've got your zoning ordinance. And uh, in order to really make this work, it is really does help to have a, land, a plan, at least a land use plan. And uh, it, you know that's, that's typically one element of a comprehensive plan. Next slide. Uh, so uh, zoning is executed by four different groups and that includes your city council or governing body, uh, your planning commission, uh, San Antonio has got a planning commission and a zoning commission. So uh, a planning commission typically is also zoning commission. The, the board of adjustment, sometimes called the zoning board of adjustment, uh, is uh, executes the zoning code and uh, also the staff. Uh, when you get uh, a lot of zoning cases, you end up having a, a lot of staff or a lot of delays. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, the planning commission typically uh, recommends the boundaries of the zoning districts on an original zoning map. And let's just say in the case of Castle Hills, you I don't know how much vacant land for future development you have, but most of your land is probably already developed and, uh, and zoned or uh, basically spoken for. If you looked at the, uh, again, if you looked at the appraisal district uh, files, you would find out what, what uses each parcel, what use each parcel is. And they have, in the appraisal district files, they have something they call the state code or the governor's code. And it is a, uh, a set of different land uses, like A1 is single family uh, detached housing, and then A2 is attached, B1 is duplexes, and so on. And there's, there's um, a whole array of uh, land uses that basically relate to zoning. Um, let's see, the, the Planning Commission, uh, Zoning Commission reviews uh, uh, and recommends changes to the ordinance or to the map. Uh, it could be called, you know, off, most of the work is gonna be rezoning and you'll, you'll see that in just a minute. Um, they also are advisory only on zoning matters in some cases uh, because uh, since the uh, zoning uh, change has to become an ordinance, the, uh, the governing body has to adopt that ordinance. And so the city council, the, the planning commission or zoning commission recommends approval or denial of a proposal, uh, a zoning proposal. And then the city council either approves or denies it and adopts the, adopts the new ordinance or does not. Uh, the planning commission also is the one to adopt a comprehensive plan and uh, if, if they aren't the one that adopts the plan, they, they adopt it. And then if, uh, if that's the final say in your uh, city, then that's it. That in many cities, it goes next to the city council uh, as a recommendation for the city council to adopt that comprehensive plan. Next, please.
the Board of Adjustment, uh, sometimes it's called the Zoning Board of Adjustment. It is uh, It reviews applications for zoning variances or variances to the zoning code. Uh, it also uh, reviews applications for special exceptions, uh, licenses or permits related. And then it is, uh, it is the one that interprets uh, unclear provisions in the zoning ordinance or else unclear lines on the map. It's basically gets settled uh, in the uh, Board of Adjustment if there are uh, there's a dispute. So we go to the staff. Couldn't do much without your staff. Uh, they actually are the administrators of the zoning ordinance. Uh, they also, uh, next, next slide there, Jack. Uh, they enforce the zoning ordinance and then they are the ones that provide information and reviews of uh, proposals uh, for the decision makers to make their decisions on. Uh, the next is uh, implementation. Now, the main activities there are rezoning, which is changing, basically changing your zoning from one to one uh, uh, category to another. Um, reviewing variances, appeals, and special exceptions are uh, part of the implementation. And then, of course, enforcement. Now, in San Antonio, code compliance uh, are officers of this of the law there and they can issue citations to people who are violating the zoning ordinance or basically any other city code. But basically uh, in, in some cases, it's uh, they're just doing the zoning ordinance. Uh, go ahead with uh, rezoning. It's uh, the most common zoning action. Uh, most, every, most of the work done in zoning is rezoning. Uh, and the map map amendment is considered to be troublesome a troublesome legislative act because it's a request for a change to the law and uh, in that case the governing body can do what it likes and only subject to uh, broad constitutional and state legislative uh, limitations so there's there's some question about that but it's common it's done all the time uh, I think in rare cases, it will, it will pose a problem. So do we have, uh, I think we've got, you skipped a couple of slides. Let's go back to one called uh, variances. That's uh, should be a uh, number 14. Variances are uh, the second most common zoning operation and uh, to alleviate, it's supposed to be to alleviate unnecessary hardships uh, that are inherent in the physical characteristics of the land. So, you know, you've got this these ordinances that apply to, to a generic piece of land, and then you have all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of different sizes, shapes, and uh, trees, uh, rocks, uh, slopes, uh, streams, whatever. And uh, in order to make a project work, they might have to have a variance to fit a project to the physical characteristics of the property. And uh, the mis misconception about variances is that first of all, a financial hardship justifies variance. And the second one is that a financial hardship justifies a use variance, not just a variance to the, to the code, but a variance to the land use. And those are not uh, those are not variances. Those cannot be uh, done by issued by the uh, board of adjustment if it's not if it's a financial hardship. So now we go to appeals. Um, uh, board of adjustment, I believe, is a, uh, in the city. Uh, council maybe uh, hears and decides appeals where there's an alleged error in one uh, a requirement, a decision or a determination made by the staff administrative official and enforcement of the ordinance. Or sometimes some cities use the appeal 
to protect the staff from having to make judgments in difficult situations. And the next uh, slide, number 16, is special exceptions. Um, special exceptions basically are is a list of otherwise non-conforming uses that could be allowed in a residential zone uh, with special after special review. And uh, there usually a city has a list of things that might might be allowed as a special exception. Now enforcement, uh, you've got a really good uh, enforcement tool and that is control of building permits. Because, you know, if you don't have the right zoning, you can't get a building permit in, in the case of uh, if, if there's zoning. Uh, and that's, a you know, like, like the occupancy permit is another enforcement for uh, other aspects of the, of the building code. But just the issuance of a building permit is, uh, is a, a stick that, uh, that the city holds to enforce their zoning code. Uh, and uh, to be effective, you've got to enforce, uh, enforce your zoning code. Uh, zoning is also enforced with these other controls. Um, uh, so you've got a zone, uh, a zoning concept. You've got a pattern. Uh, you want to basically influence land use pattern, and so you use uh, these other controls, such as the plan, which uh, will have uh, some policies in it, and it will have a land use plan uh, typically. Uh, some uh, in the last couple of decades, I think some cities have developed comprehensive plans without a land use plan. Uh, they just uh, they use uh, policies only to to try to control the land use. Um, subdivision regulations are also uh, a, a method of uh, controlling uh, what you would with zoning and what you want. Architectural controls is basically uh, more aesthetic and uh, as well as safety, uh, but that is another thing. And uh, if you don't have architectural controls, you'll probably want to have them in your zoning code. Uh, parking requirements, that is usually in the zoning code, but there can be a separate ordinance on the parking requirements. Of course, you got your building codes, you got all the all building codes related uh, to just the construction and, uh, and the utilities and uh, so forth. Another thing, of course, uh, private sector uses all the time is covenants or deed restrictions. And uh, those are ways of controlling and that's primarily how Houston controls their uh, land use uh, pattern. And they don't, they don't really have that much say about it because almost everything is uh, covered by covenants or deed restrictions. Now let's go to comprehensive plan. A common question is, do you have to have a plan to have zoning? And of course, it's not required. Uh, since the plan is advisory, uh, deviations uh, in zoning can be accepted. Um, if, if you have a plan, does the zoning have to follow it? Exactly. It, you know, in my opinion, uh, you should have a plan and, and the zoning should follow the plan, but because the zoning is a primary tool for implementing the comprehensive plan. Uh, so doctrines developed by the courts to implement and interpret the plan, comprehensive plan, are to correct a mistake rule and the spot zoning rule. The correct a mistake is, <laughs> is actually that, and it could be a fake correct, correction of a mistake, but the spot zoning is a uh, cardinal sin uh, in zoning. You can't just spot zone something in the middle of a, of a, of a zoning uh, pattern and uh, and that, that, that's just frowned on and almost nobody does that. So can we go to uh, subdivision regulations? 
subdivision subdivision regulations uh, they regulate dividing of parcels larger parcels of land into lots uh, whereas the zoning prescribes the uses how the the uses that are allowed in the buildings uh, the setbacks the size of the buildings setbacks height and uh, and uh, bulk and area requirements really uh, zoning specifies the relationships of the land uh, and the building and the placement. And um, zoning also regulates the use of land. Subdivision regulations cannot do that. They can, they can regulate the density. Uh, Why is an application for zoning? Why does an application for zoning precede an application for a subdivision review? Basically, there's two very logical reasons, and uh, one is that uh, you you can't approve you can't get a subdivision approved unless it conforms to the zoning uh, of the area your your proposed subdivision, and also the zoning is most likely to be controversial. And the subdivision subdivision act, excuse me, application is more expensive because of all the engineering work required. So that's why we need uh, zoning first. The next one, architectural controls and zoning. I think, uh, I think Jack, it's. Uh, Number 21. Sorry, we'll catch up to you. That's all right. It's slide 21. That one, the appeals is 15. One more. There it is. Now, um, the zoning code is really a logical place for architectural and other aesthetic controls uh, because it already contains something like that and that is basically the uh, setbacks and building heights and so forth. Uh, it's sometimes uh, desirable to limit the effect of, of these controls to a particular area of the community and so that's where zoning comes in handy too. Uh, but you know that uh, there there's a widespread use of overlay zones, which means they can uh, overlay additional restrictions or guidelines or whatever on a selected area of the city to, uh, to basically control uh, design and uh, aesthetics. Um, There are, it's rare to have a separate um, legislation for, to, uh, for architectural control. And that's what it would really take for a city to do that other than in uh, zoning. And let's look at, it's gonna be slide 22. That one, this is 16, special, ex uh, special exceptions is 16. So you got 20, go to 22. Have I run out of time? Oh yeah, I'm running out of time, Wendell. We're just having trouble, a little bit of trouble operating now. PDF. Okay, here we go. Uh, covenants and deed restrictions. Um, they restrict the use of recorded property and are enforceable by only a limited group of people, usually uh, other landowners in the same subdivision with the same restrictions. Covenants uh, don't have any effect on zoning and zoning has no effect on the covenants. And generally the local government has no power to enforce covenants and shouldn't intervene. Next slide is traditional land use categories. Oh, that's kind of, a, these next one are Basically, and that's slide number 23. The traditional land use categories are uh, obviously residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural. I don't know how many agricultural uses Castle Hills has, so 
this, that might not be a, a, an interesting topic for, uh, for this conversation. Uh, now, some uh, categories, typical categories of allowed uses are the, uh, that's on slide number 24. The principal uses, the accessory uses, and the special exceptions. Uh, principal are those that are uses by right. Basically, they are named. Uh, there are also accessory uses such as uh, uh, garages and outbuildings to, to the principal use. Uh, and uh, those uses are allowed only as incidental to the principal use and cannot be a, a separate. Uh, the special exception, we talked about that. Those are un otherwise non-conforming uses that are allowed in residential zones after, uh, after a review. Next one is residential uses. Uh, slide 25. Okay, good. Uh, they are distinguished by density, which is the number of lots or units per acre of property there. Uh, uses within residential districts are almost always cumulative and uh, they do exclude commercial and industrial use. They presume the zoning has always presumes the superiority of single family detached homes. Now, in the classification of, of residential, you've got single family detached, single family attached, and multifamily apartments or condos, duplexes, and those, those types of uses. Go to commercial. Uh, the distinctions usually are uh, on the perceived impact of these commercial uses on the neighborhood, and they're almost always cumulative. And uh, they're often measured by something called intensity. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Industrial uses, next slide. Uh, one of the original purposes of zoning was to separate noxious uh, industrial uses from residential uses. And in industrial use, they're, they're usually categorized as light or heavy industry. And, uh, you know, a lot of cities have two or three different classifications uh, of industrial, but uh, that's basically it. And we got an agricultural, uh, I don't think we need to discuss that. I would like to skip that. And then special uses, uh, for example, uses around airports. Um, the zoning has caused a significant economic loss where generally where that happens uh, to the landowner. The courts have been unwilling to sustain zoning to protect an airport. They don't, they don't uphold the zoning in other words, they go with the, uh, with the, with the uh, perp, I guess you might say. Then we got other special uses that we talked about before, sex businesses, signs, churches, waste. We didn't do waste disposal sites. That's one, historic districts and then floodplains. Now let's go to uh, intensity or density of zoning. And that is, uh, and, and density, of course, we talked about that. That's a minimum. You can do, in subdivision regulations, you can control the density by, by establishing lot sizes, minimum lot sizes uh, for single family. That worked pretty well. In uh, some cases, in uh, like out in Comal County, they used to have a minimum lot size of two acres uh, in subdivisions, which was uh, which basically meant that you would probably not have any community sewer or community water that every Every lot had its own way, uh, septic tank, or and its own water well. So that's the point of that was to uh, take advantage of the uh, use the size to uh, make sure they got their utilities in that way, individual utilities. Uh, 
Commercial intensity is uh, basically the combination of lot size and height and lot coverage requirements. Uh, it's in zoning, it's a you know basically a bulk bulk and area requirements. Uh, the sophisticated zoning requirements are use a floor area ratio to impose limits on commercial intensity, and the floor area ratio is uh, the floor area of the building divided by in square feet divided by the square footage of the land, and that is the floor area ratio. And the floor area ratio can include multiple floors, so you, you don't just use the ground floor, the, the footprint. Warehouse and light industrial zones uh, are usually contain intensity limitations uh, similar to, com to commercial. Stay right there on planned unit development. This is usually a mixture of, of single family and uh, other kinds of residential. Sometimes there's commercial, uh, institutional, and office uses, which make it sort of a mixed use development. And uh, uh, it was developed largely by the private sector to get let the public sector uh, have a means of regulating mixed use developments because mixed use developments you can imagine the uh, zoning nightmare of, uh, of intermingled uh, land uses. So a PUD basically uh, allows a set of uh, land uses and, and a set of regulations or a set of uh, covenants within a planned unit development. Another thing about PUDs is that uh, it emphasizes planning. So a PUD is a planned unit development. So uh, the zoning basically goes along with that. Larger tracks uh, offer developers uh, an opportunity and an incentive for better planning. Performance standards, let's just stay right there. Um, this is kind of an alternative to traditional zoning, and uh, it basically doesn't tell you what the use can be, but it tells you uh, the minimum requirements uh, or the maximum of the limits on the, on the effects or characteristics of a use uh, on the neighborhood. And rather than a traditional list of uses, it, performance standards might describe uh, the allowable amount of smoke, odor, noise, heat, vibration, glare, traffic generation, and visual impact of the use of permitted. Uh, it also defines what the community wants as an end result, but it allows the developer the choice of the means to do it. And so it's it's pretty attractive to some, uh, and in some cases, as, as we discussed, uh, there are some of these uh, special uses that uh, probably need performance standards. Uh, instead of just the uh, des use designation. And we get to uh, almost our last slide here, uh, due process. Actually, it is our last slide. Uh, if your rights are being uh, uh, determined or directed by government action, uh, you need to be notified uh, of that action and given the opportunity of a hearing. Um, local governments take steps to uh, ensure that procedure zoning is uh, is conducted in, in a fair way. And uh, they send notices out. Uh, typically it's a notices of a proposed zoning change uh, within 200 feet of the boundaries of that proposed zoning change. Um, the uh, tribunal should be impartial, which is uh, basically the zoning commission or whoever. Uh, the hearing must be fair, and the decision should be based on the hearing and on other information available. And let me just ask for if you have any questions, or has it been boring enough that you don't have to worry about that? Questions? I'd like to ask a, a question. This is Barry Middleman. Hi, Barry. Uh, how are you? Uh, this is more a question for. Uh, Ryan, the city manager, and maybe our comprehensive uh, plan, but but uh, I've seen 
certain covenants or regulations uh, that were living documents because when you put things in writing, I've noticed that there's amendments made and, and, and uh, updates that uh, you're not ever certain what particular issue you have or what dated uh, document you have. And I'm wondering if, if we've noticed tonight that our zoning map is, is not up to date uh, or the one that was shown is not current. Um, I'd like to see how difficult it'd be to not only bring it to a current state, our, our zoning map, but it'd be a living document within the city's website. So at any time, uh, in order of getting a printed zoning map, we can go to the website and bring up uh, the, a, as a living document the current zoning with any updates that maybe uh, have been impl implemented so people, uh, so, so we can avoid any arguments about what is properly zoned and what isn't properly zoned. It's there uh, and it's kept up to date. And I think we need, uh, we need uh, more specific uses uh, within our current Castle Hill zoning ordinance. Uh, I don't think that uh, commercial zoning uh, for instance, I think needs to be tied uh, with with uh, uh, specific uses or special uses within the commercial uh, zoning uh, because uh, uh, I don't think it should be so broad that we can have a controversial uh, 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 user within our uh, commercial zoning district. I don't I didn't mean to put that on you, Window. This was just some. <laughs> some general uh, comments I had to make about about us getting into the modern age with uh, our zoning for the city. Well, that can be done on with GIS. Uh, years ago, we did a uh, a map for the city of Alamo Heights, which uh, included uh, their zoning and the appraisal district uh, parcel files, and uh, and I think it. Uh, I don't know that currently if it's still uh, alive or not, but uh, it was supposed to be uh, interactive, not interactive, but uh, available for people to look at the most current uh, zoning online. And I, you know, that's not hard to do. It has to be done once and then it's, it's fairly easy to keep it up. Any comment from Ryan or uh, Jack on that? Ryan stepped out. How about you, Sorry, Jack? But, you know, it, uh, I think it's a terrific idea, and we may have some capacity to do that with the intern that Ryan has on staff now, if he can be taught the, whatever the proper software is. Um, I, I, hopefully, we'll be able to do that. I think it'd be really nice to keep it kind of up to the minute zoning map. But uh, at this point then, uh, Wendell, thank you so much for giving sure. us the kind of the ABCs of zoning in a, in a very thorough manner. We appreciate that. Sure. Uh, we've also invited Councilman Joe Isbrand and uh, Zoning Chair Juan Solis to offer their comments on maybe some of the specific things they've seen here in Castle Hills with perhaps some suggestions for things that are really good or maybe some things that might need some improvement. So if I may first introduce Councilman Joe to, to maybe offer some commentary on that. Sure, uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to see you all and thank you so much for participating in these conversations. They're so important to our city as we think about our future and a comprehensive plan for Castle Hills. Um, I'm also welcome the opportunity to share the microphone tonight with Chairman Solis, who after my seven years as chairman of the Zoning Commission, Mr. Solis came in a year or so afterwards, uh, and they've done some exceptional work. And uh, the one thing I've always said is that I, I find that the, the Zoning Commission is such an integral part 
of our city's planning process. You know, we're a general law city. Uh, we don't have a, a, a planning commission or anything of that nature here. And a lot of the work that comes uh, be, before the city comes or passes through the zoning commission at, at one point or another. You know, uh, Mr. Davis gave a wonderful primer, I think, on zoning. I thought it was uh, very helpful for anyone who's not wonky like Mr. Solis or myself and who finds these things terribly interesting to, to be a part of uh, in, in the course of our, our, our daily lives. But, um, you know, in a city the size of Castle Hills, we don't have as much of the complexity, perhaps, as some of the nuances or aspects that Mr. Davis put out there. Nonetheless, you know, our zoning ordinance, like any zoning ordinance, is absolutely integral to preserving the integrity and the character of our neighborhoods. And we have very distinct neighborhoods in Castle Hills. And it's very important that we, you know, look through the, the lens of what those neighborhoods are like and what we do to ensure the integrity of them as we go forward. You know, pretty simply put, our zoning consists of, you know, single family, multifamily, there's commercial, um, you know, you drive around Castle Hills, it's pretty, uh, pr pretty clear pretty quickly um, how our, our zoning ordinance is laid out and what we do to try to protect our neighborhoods or the different areas. The one thing that I would say in particular is the challenge that I experienced during my time on the Zoning Commission, I'd welcome Mr. Solis's comment too on this, is that it's, it's two things perhaps. Number one, in the time that I was on Zoning Commission, we spent over a year and a half invested in a cleanup, not a rewrite, but a cleanup of our zoning ordinance because it had not been through the process of review for many, many, many years. And I think what's really important in the process that we look at with zoning is that we have certain benchmarks, whether it's every five years or whatever the case may be, where we are undertaking a wholesale assessment of is our zoning code where it needs to be? Is it relevant to where conditions are today? So that we don't get into situations where we're simply trying to go in and clean up or correct one small thing versus looking at the zoning ordinance as a whole and saying, yes, this is reflective of our community, what our community wants and what we need to help guide us going forward. And the second part of that is then during the time that I was on the Zoning Commission, time and time again, we would have requests come to us for special use permits. Special use permit, in, in my simple interpretation of it, is to do something different than what the zoning ordinance allows. And my belief had always been that if, if you want to have those types of uses in an area, you should look at whether the zoning ordinance is relevant, not looking at uh, incident after incident of one-off situations, if you will, where you fine tune something, you make an exception for somebody or an exception for one case. And then you hope that years later when that one exception has expired and perhaps those individuals have moved on or that property is changing hands, that you remember to revert back to the original ordinance the way it was. It can be very complicated to try to be a traffic cop to things like special use permits. And I think this goes back to the notion then again of looking at our ordinance with some regularity and bringing in professionals to do it who can say, yes, your ordinance is where it should be in the year 2021 and for the next few years. And with great respect to everybody who served with me on the Zoning Commission in previous ones and in future ones after us, I know just how much time it really does take to look at the zoning ordinance as a whole and to try to make corrections or adjustments where you see that there are deficiencies. But that's really not going to be the way in which we're going to ensure that we have the kind of firm foundation that we need particularly when we're talking in the context now of a comprehensive plan for our city too. So again, I would simply say, I think it's very important that we look at our zoning ordinance with regularity, with some expertise brought to it to ensure that it remains up to date and relevant to where we are in terms of standards, 
um, international codes and where we are as a city. And those are really important factors that come before the Zoning Commission all the time um, and requires a great deal of deliberation by a very serious group of individuals who take their jobs, um, their jobs, if you will, very seriously and serve our community very well on the, on the commission. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, may we uh, invite Chairman Solis to make a few comments, please. Thank you, sir, and I appreciate everybody being on the call tonight. Uh, from my perspective, one of the things I think is most important uh, is, is exactly the word that, that I thought the councilman utilized correctly, relevant. What is relevant today may not be relevant tomorrow. And what's important for us is to be able, and I concur with the revisiting of our zoning rules and regulations uh, with, that we have the opportunity to ensure that they remain relevant. I, I think that's the key word. When I look at, at my role as chair, I, I quite frankly look at issues of continuity, continuity of each of the areas that in which we are getting and have the opportunity to, to provide an, uh, a response to. I, I think when, when you look at, at continuity, relevant as to today's standards from versus yesterday's standards. It's a constant moving piece of water, if you will. It constantly moves and we have to be able to be ourselves understanding of this movement. I think when you look at, at the opportunity and, and I think the councilman outlined it, we do have significant, interesting makeups of different neighborhoods within our city of Castle Hills. And each one brings its own uniqueness that needs to be adhered to, that needs to be protected, uh, and that also needs to be able to be looked upon as, as, as a continuity standard. That's what I use when I make my decisions. What is the standard that is there now? How do we protect it? The one-offs are important to me also. I think it's, it's a great point um, that we have that, but I also believe uh, and what, what is to me fundamental to all of these decisions, and that's checks and balances, meaning that there's nothing wrong with the process if somebody decides to bring forth a change, a special use change to their, to their area. Um, first of all, I'd direct them to look at the zoning and what's going on in the community. And then we understand that, that it is possible that we do have a process of, of public hearing uh, where we do listen to people's concerns and perhaps something do that. I mean, what they bring forth uh, is then debated and then voted upon. Every Castle Hill resident has the right to be able to do that. I never want to take away that right. I think what's important is as a homeowner is that we never forget that they are homeowners and they have the right to be able to, to petition us, our system of checks and balances, for changes that always has to be predicted. My fear sometimes with the comprehensive plan that it's more of a, of a plan of, 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 which is like a heavy weight placed on people to say, this is how you should be, this is how you should not be. From my perspective, I like the checks and balances of somebody petitioning for a change, a hearing being done, public input, transparency, public hearings for all to understand um, and then the commission acts accordingly. So as long as we preserve that, I think that's what we, that is essential to our growth as a city. We continue to evolve as a community. There are things here that we have, whether we go with septic or, or regular drainage, or regular sewerage, there's different things that apply for different areas based on our history, based on the constitution, I mean, of the continuity of what is there now. Most recently, as many of you know, uh, we were able to, to get the rural residential district approved before this council. Uh, the work by the city, by the zoning commission and the community was hand in hand and we had input. We had opportunities for public hearings. Um, and, and I thought it was a great example of, of how we're supposed to work together as neighbors. Uh, and I think it continues to be something that is relevant um, because it was, it was significant for us to recognize that continuity of neighborhood that needed to be consistently upheld as a standard for those that to live to, to that decide to live west of West Avenue. So, from my perspective, um, 
changes to me are, are, are part of the process. Um, appeals should be welcomed. Uh, opportunities and applications should be understood that they're going to come. Uh, and, and I think as we move forward, our neighborhoods will evolve. They may change. Um, and, and that's something that we, we've got to be able to understand. I, I remember back in the fight that they had when they put that SAM shelter across the street in Blanco, on Blanco Road. The uproar, the concern, oh my God, overwhelmingly crime, the lower rates of tax, I mean, of property values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It never happened. Yet the fear was there. Was it a fear of just of who they were? Or was it a true fear that you actually were going to see your property taxes reduced? They didn't happen. Our taxes continue to go up. Our values continue to rise accordingly. So from my perspective, we have to fear no one. We have to fear no one and allow people to put in their applications, have the opportunity to say how they want to have their neighborhood look. And to the to councilman's point early, revisiting our zoning rules and re responsibilities are key for relevancy. And I think it allows us to grow as a community and not be stagnant and stuck uh, as a community that stays uh, the way things have always been. It's the best way you, most people will say. Um, we have new families. We have new opportunities. Uh, the growth that you have seen over the last year and a half uh, with many of the zoning rules that have come through, uh, the protection of some of the neighborhoods, the continuity that needs to be continued um, is, is paramount to us. Having these, poly, these procedures of applications, public hearings, um, and we'll continue to see that. So from my perspective, um, I like the fact that the planning is constant, that we're constantly looking at how we, we continue to grow our community and evolve as a community. That's what makes us special. Thanks, Jack. Well, thank you, Juan. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Wendell. Folks, do we have any questions for these guys? Well, let me ask a question. Oh, if you may. Go okay. ahead, Denise, please. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Juan, I was around too during the SAM Transitional Living Center controversy. And I think a lot of that was manufactured mm -hmm. and stirred up. There was a lot that was revved up by a certain group of people in the city that created a lot of that. What happened? So, you know, and you're right, nothing happened except. We, it, it enhanced our neighborhood in a, in a very interesting way and brought, brought something to across the street from us that I think was ended up a benefit. So I'm with You're you. Exactly correct. The evolution of Castle Hills also means the evolution of who lives and resides in Castle Hills. Yes. Every single part of San Antonio is changing. We are not. We're not, not exempt from those type of changes. And I think families deserve to be able to enjoy the beauty, the uniqueness of Castle Hills. We all should enjoy it. You know, Juan uh, and Joe, uh, within our committee, we've discussed this. Uh, we think that uh, more integrity toward commercial development is important. And we've seen so much new commercial that's seeming to come about on the uh, eastern side of West Avenue that uh, I think would be helpful uh, and beneficial to the city to really consider the value of creating more commercial zoning districts uh with some continuity so you're not looking at a house then an office building then a then a, a nursery and then a shopping center and then another house uh i wish that there was some way for us to gain control since we're landlocked to be able to create more commercial opportunities uh, uh to give the uh the city of castle hills uh some real commercial identity 
You know, Barry, that I, I think that's a, a tough one, right? I mean, I, you know, I visited and, and we, we, I mean, you just got to go to 1604 and out and see some of the well-planned communities that exist today. We get to redo the airplane while we're flying the airplane. It's a little different concept. And so to your point, I, I respect it, but I, I also recognize um, that we were built not too long ago, actually, 1950 and so, and so houses and how we came together, uh, quite honestly, when you, I, it, when you take that high helicopter ride and you look over Castle Hills, I like the way we're laid out. I love the way we are able to coexist. You still have people on, on like the rural part versus the downtown. You realize we're seven minutes from downtown, three minutes from the airport. Um, we have the estates. You have my side over here. Um, it, it's a unique group of of areas. And to your point, yeah, Barry, I mean, I, I understand it. if we could have planned this back in the day, it'd be a whole different thing. And there are some communities being built today that you drive through, you can see, oh, look how they did that. And look how they did this. Um, the challenges has always been there. Having been a former councilman with the city of San Antonio, representing the west side of San Antonio, which is the oldest part of San Antonio, um, understood it completely. You know, how do you get new investment in, and things coming in without basically saying, well, we got to eliminate those houses or we have to make these changes. Uh, this is what I talk about the relevancy of, of evolution, time and things that take place. Who would have ever thought we'd be able to sneak in those those nice uh, uh, buildings, commercial buildings right down West Avenue across um, from Hibiscus and South. Those are the ones that think it takes some vision. It takes some thought. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to people having the creativity uh, to bring forward some more ideas as to how we look at some of the utilizations of what we have left. Thank you. Uh, and I would, I would say too um, that, you know, we, we have been working very hard to try to bring new business, new businesses to Castle Hills. I think we all understand that, you know, we need to be residential friendly, but it's important too for us to be commercial friendly because we need to be able to rely on the tax base that that we get there and if you look at some of the activity that's taking place you see some of that shifting that's beginning to happen um where you know bringing in the the soho uh wine and martini bar will be the first time that we've had a bar in castle hills in 70 years that's pretty significant um you know that's there, there is progress being made in terms of we are a destination for many reasons, but the bottom line is that we will always be a residential community. And again, with the, the uniqueness of each of the neighborhoods we have, I think that's part of what makes us so special. What makes us so valuable in the commercial space is when you come into Castle Hills, and it's pretty much you know along the, per, the the parameters, the border of Castle Hills, and you're bringing in new business, whether it's retail, whether it's professional, or whatever. Is this is a city that's very much known for being very loyal to the businesses, to their commercial neighbors that they have here, and there's a lot that really does attract, has the potential to attract new business to Castle Hills in a very responsible way while again protecting the, the integrity of our neighborhoods. And this too, I think, is where the exercise of going through, you know, the development of this comprehensive plan will be really important for us because it challenges us to ask the question, what do we want to look like as a city 10 years from now? What do we want the priorities to be versus what they are now? And we, uh, we will never reach the point where we're going to see a wholesale change, I don't believe, in the way our zoning is currently set up. But I think there's ample opportunity for us to evaluate what is the appropriate balance here between protecting our residential communities, creating a thriving commercial area, and having them if you'll pardon the, uh, the phrase here, living in harmony together. And I think that's a very important part of a planning process for a city if we're going to do this right and think about where we wanna be 10 years plus from now. Good point. Any other questions, folks?
technically we're at an hour. Indeed we are. Well, well, Wendell, thank you so much for uh, your time and putting that nice presentation together for us. Thank you, Councilman Joe, Chairman Juan. We appreciate all of your input and uh, I guess we'll say good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. See you Thursday night, night at 6.30. Thank you. Thank you.